So I thought I'd record a piece on um, all-wheel drive systems, four-wheel drive systems, because there's, uh, there's a few of them out there, but they all have um, some benefits and some problems. One of the things that's recently come to light, I think it was in Parker's I saw it, uh, they do second-hand car prices and reviews and stuff, and they show you all the second-hand car prices you might expect to pay for different conditions of car. You'll, if you're watching this, you probably know this. Um, they had a piece about how four-wheel drive is quite inefficient and there are front-wheel drive versions of cars where, you know, like the Nissan Duke and um, Dacia cars and uh, Volvo cars and various vehicles, that front-wheel drive versions that are a lot more economical. Of course, they quote figures for economy like, you know, for the four-wheel drive versions, all-wheel drive. Figures like, uh, these are small, compact, crossover SUV type vehicles. They quote figures like 55 miles to gallon. This is imperial miles to gallon. So if you're in America, it might be, I forget what it is, 10% higher or something. Sorry, 10% less because they have smaller gallons. They're talking like in the 50s. I'm not sure you'd ever get that, but that's what they're saying. Um, but the main problem with a lot of these uh, systems are that, um, first of all, it's uh, it's all still based on having what I would call an old-style setup, which is a lot of these have their roots in a very primitive setup that goes back to the old Land Rover style and stuff like that. Now, there are a couple of problems with them. I'll just list the problems. First, some of the cheaper ones used to, and they may not be any better now, I don't know, uh, Fiat Panda comes to mind. A guy who was in one once, he was going with a load of mountaineering mates to somewhere in Wales or Scotland or somewhere. They got stuck in a ditch because they were trying to move over so somebody could get past or something like that. They got stuck in a ditch. What happens is uh, they all get out to try and give the car a bit more chance to get out of the ditch and three wheels were on mud and snow. And so that says to somebody that doesn't know about all this works, well, it's going to get out, it's got three wheels, three tyres have got traction. No, the one wheel that was spinning just spun really fast. So you're just going you know, like that with the gearbox, rocking about, and, so and, and basically what you're depending on with that sort of system is that the inertia of the system, or the weight of getting the wheels turning, is so great that... Uh, the wheel that's spinning doesn't start spinning too quickly. Now, when you've got a little panda, that weight and inertia is not very much. So that wheel spins like that. Okay, so they all had to push it out of the ditch. doesn't matter the three wheels or the four were on uh, some kind of grip. Big Land Rovers. Uh, my brother had a big uh, green monster. One of the old-fashioned style, not the disco, not the, you know, relatively soft consumer brand style, but... One of the Defender types. Um, they're quite rugged and everything, but of course they give you about 30-something to the gallon. There's a big diesel thing, 2.5 litre diesel or something. Um, it's, it's a good system. But again, it actually, the reason it's so good is it relies on being so heavy, because all the wheels and everything are so heavy. Um, one of the problems they have as well is modern ones, and this has been a, a Jeep, a lot of the Jeep vehicles of this. If... Um, one of the tyres is a bit worn. Apparently, you're given dire warnings about how you must stop and get all the tyres, re, re, must be new tyres or whatever, or the same axle, maybe even any axle having tyres that are worn. So, a few millimetres different diameter at one wheel on the vehicle can cause the whole thing to wind up so much you can damage the transmission. Right? I mean, that is just baloney. I... I hate to say it, but basically, if that's your four-wheel drive system, to me, that's a non-working system. That's so bad, you wouldn't even produce it, but that's what you've got. Uh, there's other kind of traction control type systems out there. One involves braking one side. If, if, if one side at the front now, let's say, for example, the front axle, one wheel's spinning, the brakes, the ABS system, will apply the brakes on that side to force the other side to move. Uh, this is okay, except what tends to happen is you've got to have a bit of skid before it works. And, you know, that's better than nothing. There's also various locker systems around. Uh, you, you get them on what the Americans call trucks, so they get a pickup truck. You know, it's like a four-wheel drive, but with a cargo bay at the back instead of, you know, you get four cab and stuff, you know, double cabs. 
And these are locker systems whereby if one side starts spinning a lot more than the other on the back, say, for example, on the back axle, uh, this system throws out some centrifugal weights and clunk. They suddenly grab and then the, the both sides have to go together then. Uh, the problem with this system is the best grip that you can get on a tyre in snow and mud is when you're actually sat there without the wheels starting to spin yet. So you want to turn it very slowly and get you out of there. And you'd like all four wheels to do this. Instead, what happens is with that system, I mean, I saw the video the guy did, um, one wheel starts spinning, mud and dirt and snow comes out the back from underneath the tyre. Then the centrifugal force takes effect, these little clutches snap out in the middle of the drive system, and then the other one starts to turn and it spins as well. So then instead of having one spinning, you have two spinning. <sighs> okay. Um, but that's lost all your initial grip, which as I pointed out to you was the best grip, because once you start spinning, you've turned it into mush, right under the tyres where you need the grip. So, there's another problem. Um, how can you get around all this? Well, some manufacturers have gone halfway towards it now with their hybrid vehicles, like Mitsubishi, FEV, it's got a 2 litre petrol engine, but it's got two electric motors, one on each wheel at the back, and a kind of midi-sized electric pack underneath the, the rear seats. Uh, you can go all electric if you want, um, I believe with this system, because they've got one electric motor at the front as well. So they've kind of got a proper hybrid there. Now that works pretty well. Um, but that hints at where we could go, which is to have an electric motor on all the wheels and just have your internal combustion engine um, providing the electricity. Now, you might not go there for various reasons, but what I'm going towards is this. The best four-wheel drive system would incorporate effectively this principle. If you imagine an electric motor, it has a casing and a spindle. So here's the casing, here's the spindle. Normally the electric motor is held still and the spindle is made to turn by the magnets and all the electromagnetic effect in the electric motor when you feed the juice to it. But what if you hold the spindle still and you make the electromagnetic the effect act on the casing? And then what if you put a tyre around that casing? Right. So 25 years ago I came up with this idea. It's called a motor in a wheel. Other people have other names for it. They call it transmissionless drives. I heard that a few years ago from some of the University of Leeds. But basically, it's an old idea. It's based on uh, servo actuators in heating systems that have been around for 50 years from very well-known uh, valve makers, uh, wh whose name I can't remember at the minute. But these systems have been around a long time. They have epicyclic gears inside a little casing and the, the spindle does turn, it, in that sense it's normal, but you could just as easily hold the spindle, put a tyre around that casing, make it ten times the size, you've got a workable wheel, right? So that would drive the wheels, you don't need the transmission. You don't need all those gears, which is what ruined, going back to the beginning of what I said, four-wheel drives, SUVs, 90% of the time you're driving just wasting fuel because you're turning all those gears around, and when it's cold especially, the oil's cold, and there's a lot of resistance as it's like thick, gunky, greasy oil. Once it thins up, it's a lot better. But basically, you put a motor on each wheel. And it's as easy as that. Literally, the wheel is the motor. The outer, the, the steel wheel that you see, uh, houses the electromagnetics and all that, and the, the cables come in through some kind of brush system or whatever. But basically, you've got, uh, you don't need brushes, you've got, a drive system where the spindle is held still and the wheel rotates and it's got the electric motor built into each one. Now each wheel uh, may have to be made bigger than normal. Maybe you make it six inches bigger diameter, maybe quite a big diameter. But I suspect even with normal sized car wheels, because you've got four little electric motor stroke wheels, motor in a wheel situations, you've lost all the weight of the transmission. All the control is electronic. Uh, essentially, you only need a couple of things. You need to know the road speed of the vehicle and whether the rotation of the individual motor in a wheel on each corner of the car is going too much or too little compared to that. Very easy to do. You've got your ABS type system. You've got regenerative braking because each motor has got, each wheel has got a motor in it. You've got a, a battery pack in the middle and you get all your regenerative energy back. Uh, whichever wheel's got the most grip, all of them are all feeding back energy when you brake. So your brakes don't need to be as big. So you lose some weight there as well. A lot of things come down in power if you decide you don't need transmission. 
How much does that lose you? It must be about 20% power just soaked up in a four-wheel drive transmission. And if you've got that situation with a camera in the middle of the car, facing downwards, think facial recognition. The camera recognises the bit of ground beneath it. It sees how fast that's moving backward or forward or whatever. It can figure out, or using GPS, it can figure out the exact speed of the vehicle. I'd favour the camera system because if your GPS goes, your car won't drive properly. So the camera recognises a piece of tarmac is moving backward. It says, OK, according to that, the vehicle actual speed is. And then it can figure out whether the rotational speed of each wheel is correct. And it's the easiest thing in the world to make that system only turn all four wheels at the same rate, like at some low ratio um, crawler speed. And then all the wheels will only turn at that speed no matter what situation. So going back to the beginning of my little story, the panda with one wheel loose that's spinning like mad doesn't happen. It will just turn at two revolutions a minute or whatever, the same as the other three are being forced to turn. I guarantee you that even with two-wheel drive, that vehicle would be better than most four-wheel drive SUVs that are out there in really difficult conditions. I've got a big Volvo. It's got supposedly some kind of uh, containment system for free wheel spinning at the front. Uh, they call it DTS or DTC or something, dynamic traction control. But in fact, if I'm stopped in a slight incline, and I've done it, and there's ice and you've got a family in the car, you're stopped, you think, oh yeah, it's got traction control. You, you put the foot down very gently, it just spins and slides back anyway. The system I'm suggesting, it's perfect. You say you want it to go at two revolutions a minute with the accelerator position, that's all it does, and they all do it. Easy as that. And everyone gets four-wheel drive. You get a bigger vehicle, you put another couple of wheels on it, they give you some weird six-wheel drive configuration, it's six-wheel drive automatically. And you need a small internal combustion engine to give you the um, electricity if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere, like a little generator box. BMW already do this. Is it Audi? BMW? They've got a little box they stick in the vehicle for a £900 extra, you get a little generator box. So you'll never be caught out. You just leave it to run for an hour, it charges the batteries enough to get you somewhere. All-wheel drive, motor in a wheel system, transmissionless drive, that's the way it should all be. And all this four-wheel drive, gears and transmission and complex rubbish, forget it. It's all yesterday's news. Thanks very much for watching and listening.